at the end of the talk. Thank you all for coming. Um, nice to see people coming for a, a condition that is very common, uh, but also very treatable, and something that are not, not enough people see physicians for. So I'm glad uh, that you all are all here, and hopefully you can spread the news to uh, colleagues and friends and family members. Headaches of some sort or another have been known around for a very long time. And uh, have been a real source of disability for many, many years and depicted in many different ways. And I hope during this talk to sort of show you a couple of different ways that artists throughout the years, and really the centuries and millennia, uh, have addressed headaches. And one of the things that I want to really emphasize is not just a headache. Uh, people tend to minimize and de emphasize uh, the idea of headaches, people dismiss them, both uh, people who have them, as well as uh, people who are working or talking or, or spending time with people with headaches. And it's really important in some cases that those headaches be uh, you know, evaluated by a physician. Uh, and because people can get better from their headaches. They don't have to live with chronic headaches. And in certain conditions, you have to make sure that it's not something more serious. So most people have headaches. I'm sure that if I look for a short hands, the vast majority of you would have had a headache at some point in your life. Uh, it's a higher rate than the numbers show. Uh, but more importantly, there are people that are very disabled by their headaches, and that's also a very large group. 10%, 1 in 10 people have migraine headaches. Uh, and 4% of people, so 4 out of 100, have half the days out of the month where they have a headache. I mean, that's no way to go through life, and certainly not a way that I want anybody who has access to reasonable medical care uh, to go through life. From a neurologist's perspective, it's also a very common aspect of what we do. A third of all visits to a neurologist are for headaches. So this is not just a headache. This is a big uh, issue that can be disabling and affects many different people. Uh, and to put it in another, another perspective, headaches are as common as diabetes and arthritis. And just about everybody around you has those disorders, it seems like, sometimes. And certainly showing the lower left and graph of the ages of folks who have uh, who have headaches and it's a you know, very large number, somewhere in the order of 10 to 25 percent, depending on the age, have uh, headaches in some sort of number. So I just want to emphasize it's a very common sort of it's really something that shouldn't be minimized because it's very disabling. Not only is there an enormous amount of pain, uh, we all can sort of get an idea of that, but it's an emotional toll on people. People who have chronic headaches are waiting for the next one, are worried about the next one. They're away from really being engaged with their family, with their children, with their coworkers when they have a headache. If they're able to do those things at all, spend time with their kids at work, um, if they're able to do those things, they're not at full 100% capacity. They may be irritable. They may not be thinking clearly. They're really not engaged the way that you would want uh, you know, your wife, your mother, your coworker, uh, your friend, your husband, uh, to be engaged. And, and things like depression, and in fact many mental illnesses, are much more common in people who have headaches, especially migraines. Uh, and so there's an important reason to recognize this and get on these uh, disorders and treat them. It also takes an enormous financial toll because of the reasons that I've already alluded to. When people miss work, it's very common for people to miss work. And in fact, it's one of the top reasons that people miss work. And the children, adolescents and young adults miss school. And this is obviously a big problem for both uh, the people from a financial standpoint and the businesses and the people's education uh, that they miss these days. So it becomes a, a disorder with a huge toll. When we think about things like cancer and heart disease as having a big toll, but really for working adults and for school-age uh, people, this takes as big a toll as anything. In fact, if you look at disabling conditions, you look at years lost, migraines in particular, not just all headaches, and headaches in general will be higher than this, but migraines in particular are higher than things like diabetes and falls, and right up there with many other disorders in terms of the number of years lost uh, to disability. And the problem is that headaches, often undiagnosed, often untreated, usually, 50% of the time, not seen by uh, specialized physicians, or usually not any physicians at all, and people just treat these things themselves, and I think this is part of life, um, and that there isn't anything else uh, to do about this. Half a patient see a migraine, see a doctor, 
one third of people who have headaches are not given the right diagnosis. And that means probably they are not adequately treated, they're not appropriately treated. They either get too much medication, the wrong medication, or no medication at all. Many people just take over the counter medications, which hopefully, for mild headaches, may be the right thing. But it's important to try to sort that out and realize that there are other, uh, other opportunities. The lower left is uh, a papyrus from Egypt from 1500 BC talking about migraines. And it's been more than 3,000 years by my calculation since then. And yet still people are not getting as much treatment and as much evaluation for migraine and other headaches as they should be. Let me talk about a few different kinds of headaches. I kind of like to, to break it down uh, into the kinds of headaches that people think about and, and some that they don't think about. And then, of course, the ones that they worry about. Uh, sinus headaches. And I, I put that in quotes because what people think of as sinus headaches often are not. They are often uh, some other sort of headache. I mean, this is a common misdiagnosis. Uh, migraine headaches, of course, I will talk about. Uh, medication overuse headaches, which may be something that you guys are not familiar with. Uh, something that I see as a neurologist all the time. Headaches that are actually caused by medication uh, rather than helped by medication. Tension headaches, probably the most common sort of headache. Uh, cluster headaches, a very rare kind of headache uh, that affects mostly men. I'll talk about it a little bit. And then secondary headaches, the headaches that everybody's terrified of, the headaches that are due to um, strokes or bleeding in the brain, tumors, that sort of thing. Secondary, that is due to something else. Luckily, we no longer use trepanation, as in the left side of this pain, uh, to relieve headache pain. We have more sophisticated tools and medications at this point. Although some of my neurosurgical colleagues still do this for other reasons. <laughs> Let's talk about sinuses. So, from a neurological perspective, not, not the ear, nose, and throat docs, from, from a neurologist's perspective, um, this is a, a big bugaboo. Um, there are many, many, many people who have sinus problems. But then there are also very many people who believe that they have uh, sinus-related headaches who in fact don't. It is true that sinusitis, sinus problems, can lead to headaches. This is just a cross-section of nasal cavities, uh, showing some in that case, the frontal sinuses, the phenone sinuses, and there are some other sinuses. And we've all had, or at least most people I think, have had some degree of sinusitis at some point in their life. Pressure perhaps in the face, the forehead, um, because of an upper respiratory infection, mucus clogs up the area, it clogs off the drain, it still gets produced, therefore it builds up pressure in the sinuses, and eventually that pressure then pushes so hard it leads to pain, really bad pain. And that's something that the ear, nose, and throat doctor can evaluate, can try to figure out how to relieve the pressure, perhaps use antibiotics for the right patient uh, to treat the sinusitis. The problem is that many people have headaches that are, they believe are sinus headaches, and they have them over and over again once every couple of weeks, once every couple of months, once every couple of years, that sort of thing. And they over and over and over again think that they are sinus headaches. That isn't typical. People do not generally have recurrent chronic sinus headaches. And if that's the case, if somebody has headaches, they think are in that realm. Uh, it might be something else. 95%, in fact, of, quote, sinus headaches turn out to be something else. So it's a very tiny number of people with what they think are sinus headaches that actually have sinus-related headaches. And so, of course, they're getting the wrong treatment. Antibiotics, for something that isn't related, um, are not getting the right treatment for their, for their headaches. That's why it's important. The key thing here is that to, for it to be sinus headache, you really need to have yucky, green, yellow drainage coming out of your nose. And if you don't have that, it's less, much less likely that you have sinusitis and that your sinusitis is causing headaches. Uh, certainly facial pain, that's can be part of any kind of headache, uh, and nasal blockage, and a loss of sense of smell. These are some of the criteria for sinusitis, um, but are really critical things to make sure that somebody has or make sure this is in fact a sinus-related headache. The treatment for sinusitis, whether it's nasal sprays, whether it's antibiotics, whether it's an ear, nose, and throat procedure, will treat. Because if you don't have those things, it probably won't. Um, and I've seen many patients in my clinic who went as far as to have various kinds of ear, nose, and throat procedures who wound up having migraines or other kinds of headaches, and that all was for not. Um, and you can see in the chart on the lower left, sort of the percentage of patients who have uh, different uh, symptoms when they have sinusitis. And certainly 60% of folks 
have the nasal discharge. Uh, only 30% or so have the headache, which folks with fever and other symptoms. The key thing is, if you don't have the nasal drainage, you're really got to think twice about whether this is a sinus headache. So what is minor? Well, now that we've moved down to sort of sinus, what's minor? And that's really what I'm going to focus my, my talk on, because migraine is a very undiagnosed condition. And that's because it wears many hats. There are people who get one or two migraines in their life. There are people who get frequent headaches that are mild that are migraines. There are people who have visual symptoms um, that don't get headaches along with it, who in fact have migraines. There are people who get abdominal symptoms who have migraines. There are a wide variety of symptoms that can be migraine. Uh, and that's why it's so difficult to diagnose, and that's why so many people that showed in my earlier slides have migraine, aren't treated appropriately, aren't diagnosed appropriately. That's why it can be kind of difficult. Uh, with what I do, I tend to see people who have very severe migraines, not necessarily pain, although that's usually part of it, but associated symptoms, numbness on one side, uh, problems with vision, uh, problems with talking or thinking. And again, these are things that people don't think of as signs of migraine, but in fact, for severe migraines, they can be. It's important to recognize that migraine isn't a thing. It's not like a cold. You don't get it. Um, people who, who have migraines, they, are, they have some intrinsic predisposition to get for what are usually normal stimuli to sort of trigger a migraine. It's something they have all the time. They usually come on in adolescence and get less, at least in women, uh, at the time of menopause. But it's something that they have lifelong like, sensitivity, this potential to, to get significant pain where somebody else wouldn't do the same kind of trigger. The usual sort of characteristics are recurrent headaches. As I said, recurrent can be once or twice a year, once or twice in a lifetime, or it can be several times a week. Uh, the attacks usually last somewhere between a couple uh, and hours and several days. Uh, classically, they are one-sided and pulsating, but not always. And the key things are uh, usually nausea, usually sensitivity to light, and it's sort of a decreased ability to deal with it. The classic migraine patient wants to get in a dark room and just go to sleep. Um, and that's in sort of big contrast to another kind of headache uh, condition, which I'll show you. Most people who have migraine are women, somewhere in the order of 60 to 70 percent, but not all. I talked about the, the, what's the typical for migraine, but this is the um, International Headache Society criteria. So again, it's, you have to have, to be diagnosed with migraine, you have to have five of these attacks. And again, it may take an entire lifetime to get that, uh, or it may take just a week. Uh, but headaches lasting 4 to 72 hours, and they're usually unilateral or pulsating, moderate to severe in quality, uh, or aggravated by sort of usual things. Um, and typically nausea, vomiting, photophobia, that is uh, sensitivity to light, are things that people have from, uh, from migraines. And certainly it's not from something else if, if it's a migraine. As I said, most of the time these begin at puberty, and they affect people 35 to 45. That is people who are working in the prime of their lives, and that's why they're so disabling. Uh, it's much less disabling for an 85-year-old uh, to, to take a day off, or a 5-year-old to take a day off, than it is for a 35 or 45-year-old who's working, taking care of the family, um, you know, has responsibilities. And we don't fully understand the pathophysiology, the mechanism by which migraines happen. But we know that the, the nerves in the brain, particularly the, the trigeminal nerve, which comes out of the brain, uh, gets activated in some way, uh, leading to some sort of inflammatory cascade, um, and that changes the blood vessels in the brain. And so it's that change in the blood vessels that then leads to the pain and the pulsing and the pounding uh, that are characteristic of, of migraine. Um, we've already talked about the features, of course, the headache, usually moderate or severe, but not always. As I said, there are forms of migraine we call acephalgic. That is, there's no headache. There's just the other things that go around along with migraine. Light sensitivity, uh, and, uh, just decreased ability to function, uh, some of the visual symptoms without any headache. Again, rare, unusual, uh, but can happen. A headache, nausea, unilateral pulsing, 
um, duration. Usually people have a bad headache for a couple of hours. Sometimes that bad headache can last for a few days, but certainly the after effects of a migraine are very significant. Uh, even if you don't have the real bad headache, all of those after effects can last for a couple of days. So I said, most of the time, especially in women, uh, migraines start uh, in puberty. The usual 16, 18-year-old girl is the sort of typical uh, initial migraine patient. Uh, if the symptoms start substantially after that, 20 is okay, 30 is okay, but if you see a patient who comes with some migraine-like symptoms in the 40s, 50s, 60s, either they didn't realize when their migraine started, and when I talked to them, they realized, oh yes, in fact, those episodes you had back then were migraines too, or there's something else going on. It would be unusual for a migraine to start completely uh, in the 50s or 60s. There are a couple different types of migraine. If you go to the IHS criteria, there are probably 20 different kinds of migraine. But uh, for the purposes of this, there are a few main kinds of migraine. There's the, what we call the classic migraine. And that's the migraine with aura. It's the people who have visual symptoms, it's wavy lines who have uh, colors, uh, who have sort of distortions in their vision, absent spots in their vision, blurry spots in their vision, migraine with aura. And that's the easiest one for uh, family practice docs, ED docs, and neurologists to figure out. You come in with those symptoms, pretty easy to know that you have a migraine. Uh, it's the, frankly, the people without aura on the top line that actually makes up 70%. They don't have the aura, they just have the headache and associated symptoms. A little more difficult to figure out. But still, you see a, a you know, board-certified neurologist and you know, good family practice doc, they should be able to figure that out. There are some migraine variants, and I've already mentioned asymptomatic migraines, those with that headache. Uh, there are migraines that lead to paralysis on one side, which are often confused with strokes. And there are other sorts of migraines that are very rare. Uh, but the point is, there's a lot of different sorts of migraines, but most of them are the unilateral pounding headache uh, that lasts for 4 to 72 hours, goes on for a couple of days. This is an example of artist rendering of what membrane aura can look like. And you can see sort of the simulation of the fortification, this wavy line. Some people describe it as sort of television static in their vision. This is another artist rendering of sort of a different kind of migraine aura. People have these weird visual things. And again, when somebody describes this to me, I'm pretty sure that this is what uh, that this is membrane migraine. Uh, but they don't always describe them quite this, this vividly. And certainly, can make never take pictures like this. Also, sometimes people will either in the lower left move the spot of their vision will become black, or it'll become blurry, kind of like in the upper right. A couple of different kinds of treatments for migraine. Sometimes the appropriate thing is no treatment. When patients who have one migraine, you know, you know, if you take two aspirin, you have another one and call me. Uh, but if you're not having frequent migraines, there's no need to have prescriptions, there's no need to have uh, you know, a complicated regimen. But for patients who have severe or disabling headaches, those that you know, missing days of work um, are you know, bothered by their, uh, by their headaches, there is more than seven migraine or uh, you know, over-the-counter medications. There are medications that work much better, that work faster, um, and that, that help with the symptoms of that. We call these either acute or aborted medications. They abort the headache. You take them as soon as possible at the onset of headache. And so one of the things that I emphasize to my patients uh, about, about migraine is that you really have to get there before it builds up steam. Once the headache is really built up ahead of steam, it's harder to stop it. Um, no different than a boulder rolling down a hill. If you stop at the top, you can probably just stop it with your hand. But if it gets going, it's going to run you right over. It's going to run over the medications. A medication that might stop a migraine from beginning isn't going to do that. It's been raging for three hours and things are totally disabled. So it's really important to take whatever medication is, again, that is something over the counter or prescription, uh, and immediately at the first sign uh, because it may not work longer. For people who are having <coughs> more frequent migraines, not just particularly painful or disabling ones, because those can often be treated with the uh, acute or board medication, but for people who have frequent migraines, two, three times a week, I start to put those patients on prophylactic medications, that is, preventative medications that can keep away the migraines. If they work perfectly and have no side effects, of course I put everybody on them. They can, for particular patients, have side effects and not work perfectly. 
they in general will reduce symptoms somewhere in the order of 30 to 70 percent. So it will reduce the number of headaches and it will make them less severe, uh, but it will not it will not make them go away completely. So they usually use a preventive combined with a uh, with an avoided medication. And there are a whole long laundry list of medications in both of these uh, categories. And I try to match the medications, and all of them have side effects. And so uh, people who come to me and say, hey, I have insomnia and I have migraines. I give them medication you take at night that helps you sleep and also takes care of the night. For the people who have high blood pressure, there are migraine medications, preventive medications you take every day to lower blood pressure. So I give them that medication. So I match the uh, sort of the other things the medications do with the other problems the patient may have. And so there isn't really a one size fits all for that. Very important though is that there are many things that patients can do that don't involve medications. And most people figure a lot of these things out by the time they come to me. There are often triggers. Uh, common ones would include either having caffeine or missing your cup of coffee in the morning. It might include skipping breakfast, it might bring on somebody's migraines. Uh, driving at night with oncoming headlights might trigger somebody's migraines. Um, either exercising or not exercising, depending on, on the patient. All of these things can affect migraines. Foods can. For many people, wine and red wine especially will trigger their migraines. Uh, certain foods will, uh, cheese is another common one, will trigger migraines. And so people have to sort of keep track of things that potentially are triggers and avoid them, and then do things that we know can reduce uh, the frequency of migraines. Uh, in most people, regular exercise helps doing your best to reduce stress. And I admit that if I had a way to reduce everybody's stress, I wouldn't be giving talks at Silver Cross, I'd be retired. Um, but it's something you've got to focus on, whether that means devoting time to uh, meditation or to hobbies or just sort of being aware that this is an important thing that you have to, that to work on actively. Um, some people benefit from counseling or psychotherapy. Uh, and you know, I have patients who do biofeedback, patients who do uh, acupuncture. I do various other forms of alternative medicine therapies, which really can help dramatically with their migraines um, and other headaches. So it just sort of depends, and that's why it's an individualized approach, not just with medications, uh, but with sort of lifestyle things that can really help a lot with, with migraines. And just to emphasize again, I mean, the migraines have a really big impact on you. Know, look at kids who miss you know, I have, I have a patient now who's missing days and days and days of school as we try to figure out her mind. This is having a big impact on our education and protects the rest of her life. It's not just a thing. Uh, people who miss work, uh, you know, they lose their job if they miss enough of these days of work. Uh, so it's, it's really something that um, you don't have to suffer with and it is definitely worth uh, for people who have migraines that is affecting, uh, that, that they're, you know, they're just so tired of dealing with. It's worthwhile to see a neurologist, see whether there's an alternative regimen, whether that is lifestyle and uh, behavioral things, or whether that is medications, uh, to sort out whether you can really reduce that dramatically. The flip side of this um, is medication overuse headaches. It turns out that if you uh, take somebody who doesn't have headaches, and you give them a, even something as simple as a couple of Tylenol every day, and you do that for six months, most of these people, and if you stop the Tylenol, will develop headaches. So you become used to it somehow, and then using so much of the, any analgesic, any pain relieving medication over time, makes you dependent on it and get headaches without it. So in the same vein, there are some people that you give them enough pain medication they actually develop, pain, develop headaches on the pain medications. So the, the pain medications lead to headaches. And there's a whole category of medication overuse headaches. And I, I mention that only because it's not uncommon for somebody that has migraines twice a, you know, twice a week or twice a month, they start taking a lot of Advil, Tylenol, you know, Norco, any sort of uh, pain medication, you're taking that all of a sudden, you know, three times a week, four times a week, five times a week. Now all of a sudden they've got a headache every day. It was twice a week, now it's every day. And they've got medication overuse headache on top of their relief. Um, 
something, but it doesn't have to do that. Somebody can have back pain and get a headache because they're taking analgesics all the time. Uh, so this is another thing that I see in the clinic. That to deal with because people usually have pain for a reason and we have to find a way to reduce the amount of pain medication they're taking to actually paradoxically help their headaches. Again, it's like five percent of people have this. You think, oh, I've never heard of this disorder, I don't know anybody like this. It's actually a lot of people, especially in my clinic, I would say. Um, again, if taking medication for pain becomes a daily thing, um, especially when it's for headaches, then there's a problem. Um, and these medications are going to become less effective, and these strange things may start happening. We'll move on to a different kind of headache. We've talked about you know, sinus headaches, we've talked about migraines, we've talked a, a little bit about medication overuse headaches. Tension type headaches are probably the most common. I think everybody's had one of these. Uh, more of a band like headache, not the unilateral pulsing of a migraine, but a band like sort of over a root. Typically moderate, perhaps mild in intensity. Um, and it's the most common uh, headache disorder. They say 70% in the International Headache Society numbers, but I would say it's 100%. Um, you know, usually these things are due to stress. Um, they tend to be, we call it tension, it's a tension in the muscles. Um, so that can either come just from stress, and, uh, but it can come from the things that stress does. or clench their teeth, they tense up the muscles when they're stressed. Perhaps there was an injury that led uh, to neck pain or you know, tensing the neck muscles. Um, you know, these sorts of headaches that lead to tension in the muscles, they don't come from anything bad, and they typically can be treated with uh, you know, basic analgesics um, and you know, aborted pretty, pretty easily. And they tend not to develop into anything, they tend not to become chronic, uh, but they can. There are situations in which they have to be uh, managed uh, by an analogist on a long -term basis for rare attention headaches that become common. Cluster headaches are a very rare kind of headache. They affect almost universally men. It's about one in 1,000 headaches. And in contrast to the migraine patient, who, again, generally female, generally when they have the headaches, want to sit in bed with no lights, the cluster headache patient can't stop moving. It wants to run around the room, move around the room, always moving. And instead of just laying there, uh, there's actually more suicides among cluster headache patients than among any of the other kinds of headaches because they are so painful. It leads to runny nose and watery eye on one side of the face. Um, and really not very well understood why these headaches come. Interestingly, they can be treated with oxygen. Just give regular old oxygen to a little prong of the nose. Uh, that generally treats uh, cluster headache. And so in a very unusual uh, case of uh, or cause of headache. You know, as a neurologist, I probably only see three or so cases of this a year. You know, I'm seeing pieces of pieces of headache all the time. Secondary headaches. These are the ones that everybody worries about. People are concerned. I have a headache, therefore I have a brain tumor. I have a headache, therefore I'm bleeding in the brain. I have a stroke. I have something like that. This is what people worry about. Luckily, this is very, very, very uncommon. Uh, less than 10% of headaches. Uh, or any sort of secondary headache. And I already mentioned medication overuse headaches. That's a large proportion of that 10%. Uh, other things such as a fever, uh, so a, a cold or an infection somewhere else can tend to lead to headaches. And this is vast majority of the so-called secondary headaches. The headaches that are due to another medical condition that's then causing the headache. Um, this is a relatively small part of all headaches, less than 10%. Uh, and even most of those are benign and self um, So the usual causes are, as I mentioned, medication overuse, infection, electrolyte disturbances, trauma, so a bonk on the head, and you know, that secondarily causes you to get a headache. And that, that all goes all over the time. They are very rarely due to the things that people worry about. So less than 1% of headaches are due to strokes or bleeding in the brain. Um, much less than 1% of headaches are due to brain injury conversion. Uh, and a very small number, less than one in 1,000 headaches is due to a brain tumor. So again, the things that people really worry about, oh, I have a headache, I have a brain tumor. Extraordinarily uncommon. And the symptoms are generally very different. And so uh, in, in this particular study, I can't go through all of it, but in general, the way that patients present, the things that they complain about, the way things go, is very different 
and the secondary headaches, and the primary headache disorders we talked about. Um, and so it's, it's sort of very easy to sort out from a neurologist standpoint, typically, uh, you know, which of the headaches we have to worry about and which ones we don't. What are some of the things that we think about when we worry about the headaches? What makes us do a little bit more work? Well, the person who said, you know, I never get headaches, and now I've got them. Well, it makes me worry a little bit more. I'll probably do a scan. Um, you know, the headache all of a sudden came out of the blue, boom, split second. Also, it makes me worry a little bit. That's not so usual with the other headaches. Um, or if somebody's had headaches for a while, but something is dramatically different. They used to be unilateral and pulsing, and now they're in the back and they're constant. Something like that. Something that's sort of a dramatic change in what the headaches are like makes me worry a little bit more. And as I mentioned, though headaches in young or old people uh, for the first time are kind of unusual. People who have some sort of medical problem, they have cancer, they have immunosuppressed for some reason, they're pregnant, uh, these are situations in which there's a higher likelihood that the headache is something bad. People who have seizures or pass out with their headache. That's pretty unusual for a migraine or tension headache. and often suggests something else is going on. People with headaches are triggered by some sort of exertion, working out, something like that. Uh, that's not so usual for the other kinds of headaches, as it is for the secondary headaches, things like brain tumors, strokes, aneurysms, that sort of thing. Uh, and people who have neurological symptoms, numbness, tingling, weakness, that last for quite a while, and they, 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 that can happen over a short period of time for other sorts of they last for a while, I get a little more concerned. And certainly, if by the time the patient's coming to my office in the emergency room, they still have neurological symptoms, then that's more concerned. And again, by neurological symptoms, I mean weakness on one side, trouble talking, trouble walking, that sort of thing. So, I've kind of gone through a lot of what I wanted to say about headaches, and oftentimes people have a lot of questions uh, about headaches, about things that they've read, or things that they've felt, or people that they know, or medications. Um, and there's sort of lots of new different things that are going on with headaches. So I'm happy to talk about any of those things. But I just wanted to give a brief overview uh, here, just give a bibliography or uh, attribution of some of the slides and uh, pictures that I've used. Um, here in Silver Cross, there are three members of the neurologist, four certified neurologists, uh, up in Suite 450, Plan A, myself, Dr. Wow, and Dr. McCain. We see headaches or day in and day out uh, at Silver Cross. And we're happy to see uh, loved ones and family members and patients here, uh, and for all as well as other neurological conditions. So I'd open it up to questions, see what people uh, want to talk about. I'm happy to go through things. 